the thing is you live on this world once you have one life so if you have many different kinds of interests you should be pursuing them or you should be doing the things that you want to do you should have some confidence in yourself that if you're willing to give all these opinions so much validity for whatever reason you should also be able to trust your own instincts and try and pursue that and see where that leads you hey everyone so today as the title of this video probably suggests um, we're talking about living a minimalist lifestyle and the four realizations I had living this for about over a month and a half. So I was talking to a really good friend recently, after months. When I was explaining my situation to her, she literally just paused me halfway through and said, Shivang, you need to document this. Now, as I was thinking about documenting this as well, something else has always been on my mind um, for a very long time has been starting a YouTube channel. Her suggestion and then my desire to have a YouTube channel at some point in my life sort of meshed really well. And here we are where my first video is actually going to be about this minimalist lifestyle that I've ended up living. Honestly, living in this sparsely furnished apartment, I've been able to prove to myself something that I've thought for a very long time. But I don't really need too much to be happy. And having fewer things, it's actually been quite liberating. I've literally had so much room to think about the things that I really want to do in life and the things that really, really matter to me. But before we get into that, I do want to first talk about just how I got into the situation. So a couple months ago, I was just living my regular life in DC, working my regular job, and I'd already lived here for over two and a half years. I was planning to actually transfer to Toronto, Canada, um, and this was really in line with a lot of the ways that I wanted to live my life. I'm somebody who just really loves to travel and really likes to be in a place for a good amount of time, you know? Not just going to a place, seeing what's important and then saying that I've seen the whole place. For example, I wanted to go to Paris, see the Eiffel Tower, call it a day. Go to India, see the Taj Mahal, go to Canada and see the Niagara Falls and say, yep, um, I've seen the full country. What I love to do is be in a place for a good enough amount of time. So that could be a couple of months or even a longer period, like two, two and a half years and really understand the place and figure out some cool aspects about myself through this whole process. At the risk of sounding cliche, I really do believe that if you don't travel and experience new things, you've really just lived all of your life on one sort of chapter or one page. Now, in preparation for moving to Toronto, um, I had already packed up all my furniture that I had in my apartment and I'd only shipped it off to a storage location. But then, of course, as we all know, the pandemic happened. And with that, a lot of countries responded by closing their international flights. Uh, visa processing was paused or even halted. And what this really meant for me is that I just was stuck in DC. I couldn't go to Toronto. I couldn't even go back home to India. I was really just here. I had no furniture in my apartment anymore. And just the bare necessities I needed um, that I expected I would only need for about a week or two. And so this includes just a couple blankets, a couple pillows, this chair, an LED light, my phone and my laptop. So now I find myself in this very sparsely furnished apartment that once housed this incredibly luxurious and comfortable leather couch that you could just sink into and spend hours on. Um, a gold PlayStation 4 limited edition that I was pretty proud of snagging. This huge uh, TV a bed with this really comfy Tempur-Pedic pillow that was probably as heavy as I am. But living in this minimalist fashion, I'm not gonna lie, deep down, I did know that I would enjoy it. So now, without much further ado, here are the four things I realized um, as I lived in this space um, for over a month and a half. Number one, having fewer things is deeply liberating. You know, I often joked with my friends that all I really need to be happy is running water, a safe and comfortable place to sleep, being able to take a shower once a day, having enough clothes, and being able to eat some really good food. Literally just want good food, rest, hygiene, and shelter. And also internet. My friends rightfully thought, you know, I was just joking or I was definitely going in way over myself because again, I am the person who did own that leather couch, who did own that gold PlayStation 4 and who did really enjoy that huge television and bought that Tempur-Pedic pillow. So, I mean, yes, um, some doubt or skepticism over me saying those things is totally fair. But I knew that, you know, if somehow one day these things were sort of taken away from me, I wouldn't be super pissed about it. 
but it's something I knew deep down, not some, not a way that I actually lived my life. It's kind of funny or sad to say that at some point, you know, you actually own things, but later on, those things and those comforts really do start owning you and your existence. They're kind of those proverbial golden shackles, if you will. You know, as I said, I've always really appreciated and valued experiences and travel over everything else. And yet, in this period of two and a half years in DC, I somehow found myself collecting all of these things, these heavy things that did um, weigh me down. But now that I don't have them, I honestly feel so liberated for having fewer things to have to care about and literally having so much more room in my mind to just think about the things that I really do care about those creative projects and things I've always wanted to do. I no longer have uh, my couch calling for me to just come sit, lounge on it, sink in and relax with a PlayStation 4 remote in my hand and playing Dark Souls, Skyrim or Witcher for hours. Instead, what I've been using my time on is learning some new skill that I've been interested in. Um, I actually, I don't mean to brag, I finished a statistics specialization that was estimated to take upwards of 20 or 25 weeks in three and a half weeks, period. I was actually amazed at the end of each day when I was doing this course, just how much I was able to focus on it and how much I was able to learn. Because I can promise you that if I had my PlayStation just lying there right next to me while I was learning this, I would be so tempted every half an hour or 45 minutes to just go in and like plug in a game and play it for a bit. And that bit would become 30 minutes, would become an hour, would become two hours. And then I would just say, hey, I'm just gonna do this course some other time, maybe tomorrow. I also baked the fluffiest, lightest, most incredible cheesecake. Something I've been wanting to make for the longest time. It, it liberates so much of your time and also so much of your mind space to just do the creative things you've been wanting to do for so long, but somehow always felt constrained in time for. And this actually brings me to point number two. I am very much a product of my environment, whether or not I intentionally or unintentionally design it. I think this is a pretty simple theory to grasp, but it's very different actually living through it and actually implementing that in your life. But now that I've actually lived in two very stark environments or realities, one really furnished comfortable and the other, which is barely furnished, but has the necessities I need uh, for the basic comforts I need in my life. What I found was that if you're not intentional about the literal things that you bring into your space, into your environment, these things are going to start shaping your existence because they're gonna start shaping the way you really spend your time. As I said, now that I have fewer things, my couch is no longer calling to me, neither is my PlayStation 4. What calls me instead are these ideas and creative thoughts I've always had in my life that I just never really acted on. Going back to that cheesecake, I had the most incredible cheesecake and I traveled with my mom in Japan when I was a kid. And I've always been wanting to have that since then. Unfortunately, I don't have all the riches in the world to just take a helicopter and fly to Japan and eat the cheesecake when I want to. But also, it's very much 2020 and I should be able to make a really good cheesecake that's reminiscent of the one I had in Japan if I want to. And so that's what I did. I looked up a good cheesecake recipe online. I made it. it was exactly how I imagined the Japanese cheesecake to be. And it caused a flood of memories just coming back in. You know, since then I've actually ended up, I've made two of those cheesecakes. And it also means that I ate two full cheesecakes. And I know I should be going on runs to burn that off. And I am. But I'm so proud that I could make something like this that I know I really love. What this really brings me to understand and how it is going to shape my future is the next time I live in a new space, I'm going to be very intentional about the things that I bring into my life. I want to make the space actively encouraging of creative activities, generative activities, and discouraging of just passive consumption. I don't anymore want the kind of bed or the kind of pillow that encourages me to just lounge on it for hours while I endlessly scroll through social media. I don't want a couch where I can just sink in, relax, and feel like everything is okay, when in fact, I really do want to go and make things. I wanna add some friction to these more non-generative activities. And this actually also brings me to point number three. There's a difference between nourishing yourself and enjoying yourself. Very often, um, and actually I would say most of the time, nourishing activities are enjoyable activities. But honestly, activities that you find enjoyable don't have to be nourishing. Many times they aren't. Let me give you some examples. So recently, once self-care became a thing, and became really hyped up and corporations sort of realized this is something they could monetize and profit from, 
self-care began getting associated not with sort of mindfulness and things that actually matter, but instead very um, surface level, superfluous things, such as sitting in a bathtub for 20 minutes and plopping a glittery bath bomb and thinking that's how, that's what your body really needs. Or thinking that what you really need after being mentally exhausted is pouring a full bottle of wine and watching some trashy reality TV show for a lot of hours um, on a weekend. These things would often just leave me more drained than I started and I would just be so tired, I would just fall asleep. I wouldn't fall asleep from a positive kind of exhaustion, but really just being absolutely drained that my brain just needed that rest. Instead, what I'm gonna be calling nourishing activities, they're the kind that make you feel a positive sense of tired. And to help you understand that, that's the kind of tired you feel after taking a really hot shower after a really good workout, where you're just so nicely exhausted, you just wanna fall asleep and have the best uh, night's rest of your life. It's either something like that, or there are activities that leave you more energized than you were before. A really good run, or learning something new, or journaling about something you've really cared about. Something that leaves you even more energized than you were going into it. These past couple of weeks, I've just automatically been passively consuming a lot less because my environment hasn't been encouraging me to do so. Instead, I've been creating a lot more and making a lot more and honestly i've been really enjoying this new way that i've been spending my time and i'm going to be doing it a lot more often and finally point number four i'll only be happy living life on my terms and not somebody else's and i have to be a lot better at tuning out other people's thoughts and opinions about how life needs to be lived and really be trusting my own gut and my instincts on what really makes me happy and pursuing that, that what makes me happy, with this sort of single-mindedness and steadfastness. Is steadfastness a word? I don't know. But I'm going to be very steadfast, at least, in pursuing this goal or pursuing this gut instinct of mine about what makes me happy and really learn to isolate or tune these other thoughts out of my mind. I'll tell you how I came to this realization, as simple as it does sound. When I was explaining my situation to a lot of my friends and other people, a lot of the reactions were either sympathetic or they were trying to say that I was being super optimistic about it, which had an underlying assumption that the situation just wasn't a great situation to be in. But the fact that I was actually really happy and that other people couldn't understand it, I think made it really crystal clear for me that sometimes, I would say oftentimes in life, we do know what makes us happy. And other people have many different other visions of what makes a happy life, a successful life, maybe even an enviable life. But all of their thoughts on what leads to any of those kinds of lives is also just totally informed by media, informed by what they hear from their elders or from other people in their life, maybe books they've read. Everybody is really trying to figure out what makes them happy. And so to believe that somebody you speak to necessarily knows what that is, you know, good luck. So one particular idea that's been unlocked in my mind this kind of critique that I've had in my mind for the longest time, for as long as I can remember, probably since, you know, the 11th or 12th grade of high school, is I was always very hard on myself for not having a single kind of passion to be pursuing for the rest of my life. In fact, even when I went to college, I majored in computer science, but I also studied a lot of other things. I minored in religion studies, which is pretty philosophical and has a lot of social theory in it, and I also did a minor in digital art. I've always been the kind of person who's loved to learn about a lot of different things. And I've never been the kind of person to follow a straight and narrow path that's very, very specific. And I have been actually jealous a lot of times of people who, you know, go ahead and pursue a single PhD. Not the fact that they're doing a PhD, but the fact that they know that this is really, this really specific subject or thing that they're studying within that subject is what they really love doing. For as long as I can remember, I've never had such a specific interest for something. I've always just been the sort of person who has very broad interests and likes to learn a decent amount about a lot of different things. That's what brings me joy. And many times in my life, I had people tell me things along the lines of, you should really be careful, you don't want to become a jack of all trades. What is so wrong about being a generalist? For some reason, people really love this idea of this single-minded, super passionate person about like one, you know, specific goal. And they don't really treat generalists very well, or they think that people who have many different ideas are somehow distracted. The thing is, you live on this, world once, you have one life. So if you have many different kinds of interests, you should be pursuing them or you should be doing the things that you want to do. 
If other people have many different kinds of opinions about how you should live your life, well then they have their life to practice that thought and practice those ideas. You can accept them, you can hear about those ideas, definitely don't disregard them, but you don't necessarily have to be hard on yourself for not following that idea. So again, this is all to say that I've really enjoyed living this sort of minimal lifestyle. It's really brought about so much growth in me and I've been able to use it to be so much more creative than I was before. Cool, so if you watched all the way here, well, thanks for watching. I was really excited to share this video and I hope you got something cool out of it. I'm really excited to be able to revisit this video a couple months from now and just, again, remember this kind of moment I had and the circumstances that I lived in. I'm gonna be making a lot more videos now, I'm sure of it, um, so I'm gonna to talk to you all soon. Thanks.